and some general aspects of respiratory illnesses. We're going to look at these um, d depending on where they are in the respiratory tract. We'll first look at upper respiratory tract illnesses, which is nose, pharynx, larynx, and the upper portion of the trachea. Then we'll look at lower respiratory tract infections, which is the lower trachea, the bronchi, out into the bronchioles, out into the alveoli. And we'll separate out croup syndromes and look at those separately as well. Now, respiratory illnesses are a major source of acute illnesses in children. That is, you know, they have colds all the time, runny noses, sniffles, um, lots of respiratory illnesses. Infants less than three months actually have a lower rate of respiratory illnesses, and this is probably because they still have some of the maternal antibodies. They haven't lost all of the antibodies from mom um, that they got while they were in utero. And breastfed babies have less illnesses in general than bottle fed because they continue to get some of those antibodies from the mother. Between three months and six months, this is where we really see an increase in the infection, the rate of infections. And toddlers and preschoolers have just kind of chronic uh, respiratory infections going on practically. Lots of respiratory infections, high rate of viral illnesses, and uh, most of those are respiratory. Once they're over five years, we start seeing um, a change, less of the viral illnesses, and we'll get mycoplasm, the mycoplasmal pneumonia and beta strep, which is your strep throat. And you talked about uh, your beta hemolytic strep probably last semester. As kids get older, particularly once they get over five, they start to have a few less infections. And this is just because they've been exposed to so many things, now they have some immunity against it. It's either the same or very similar to something they've had, and so their body is better uh, at fighting it off. So why are children so predisposed to respiratory illnesses? Well, it's the size of the airways. They have these very narrow airways, and then if you have any swelling in there, you've narrowed that airway down to the point that they have difficulty breathing. It's also the distance between the structures. It's a very short distance from an infection in the throat to get down into the trachea, to get down into the, the bronchi, to get out into the bronchioles and the alveoli. Everything's close together. It's not hard for it to move. And the eustachian tubes are also part of that. That short, straight eustachian tube, um, because it's short, it's easier for things in the throat to travel up into the middle ear. Because it's small, a little bit of swelling will pinch it off, and we'll talk more about the eustachian tube later. And uh, resistance. What lessens a kid's resistance, or what makes them more susceptible? Well, any sort of deficient immune system. Due to age, their immune system is not mature when they're born. Malnutrition, if they're not well nourished, their immune system's not going to be working well anemia, and we said they get that physiologic anemia right about the time they're starting to be more susceptible, remember? And then fatigue. Um, if their body is stressed, tired, uh, you know, anything that really stresses out their body is going to make their immune system not as effective. Kids who have a lot of allergies or asthma, that makes their immune systems, you know, they're working on against the allergens. They're, it, just not going to be as effective. Preterm birth, uh, that lowers their resistance. Any cardiac anomalies, uh, these kids that get a minor respiratory illness, they do very poorly. Cystic fibrosis, we'll be talking about that. Daycare, they're exposed to more, they get more. And secondhand smoke, Sm secondhand smoke kind of keeps everything a little bit irritated in their respiratory tract. So it doesn't take much to trigger a far worse reaction. Now seasonal variations. We do notice that certain illnesses go with certain seasons. Our respiratory illnesses are mostly in the winter and the spring. Uh, mycoplasma, pneumonias, those are more common fall and winter. Asthmatic bronchitis is mostly in the cold weather. Now that's um, kind of 
averaging all children, you're going to find it depends on what the child's triggers are for their asthma. Around here, the fall, when we have that um, thermal inversion where our air doesn't move and it's hot, there's a lot of particulates in the air. That's kind of that, you know, September, the beginning of school. They're always talking about how bad our air quality is. For a lot of kids in our area, that's going to be their worst time just because there's so much stuff in the air. For some, though, it's winter because their triggers are molds. For some, it's spring because their triggers are pollen. So it, it varies a lot with from child to child, but overall, most common is cold weather. And then RSV season is in the winter and spring, and we'll talk about RSV. Clinical manifestations of respiratory illnesses, they vary with age. Uh, they're more severe on kids six months to three years. They can have generalized signs and symptoms um, as well as local manifestations, and those will differ. They're going to have things like fever, but you'll see anorexia, so they have no appetite, and particularly on a baby, it's just too hard to eat and breathe. They'll vomit, even though we're talking about respiratory, it'll trigger vomiting. Probably they're swallowing a lot of mucus that the upsets their stomach. They'll get diarrhea, um, probably the same thing. It probably it has to do with swallowing mucus, but it can trigger diarrhea and abdominal pain. Then the more classic respiratory signs, cough, sore throat, nasal blockage, the runny nose, the nasal discharge, um, and let me just point out on nasal blockage, infants are obligatory nose breathers. They, their brain doesn't tell them, if my nose is plugged, I'll breathe through my mouth. They just try to breathe through that plugged nose and work really hard to breathe. So if we section out their nose, they do really well. Uh, older kids, though, you know, when their nose is plugged, then they breathe through their mouth. But on infants, they don't do that. And then another manifestation we're going to see is the breath sounds. So some of the interventions for respiratory illnesses, we want to ease their respiratory efforts. And we can uh, tell, teach families this to use a humidifier. Um, they make both warm and cool mist humidifiers. In general, what's recommended by pediatricians are the cool mist ones because the warm one, you get a curious toddler who goes over and pulls it over on themselves and they can burn themselves with that warm water. Uh, we want to give them rest. And so if we're working with them, we want to group activities so they get rest periods in between. We said that's going to help their immune system work its best. We want to help them be comfortable. And this is where we may need to use that nasal aspirator or blue bulb suction. Or at children's, they have these little um, neo suckers. They're sort of like the adult uh, yonker suction, but they're smaller. And uh, we can use those in the nose. And then we want to prevent the spread of infection. This is good hand washing and teaching the child to use hand washing, teaching them to use tissues after they cough or sneeze into the tissue, throw it away and wash their hands. So that's um, teaching we can do with the child. And then interventions we need to treat temperature, hydration, and nutrition. Although remember nutrition is not as important as hydration. Okay, upper respiratory tract infections, also called URA, URIs. We're talking about the nasal pharynx, and this is the common cold. This is the most common one and also the most mild one. Infection, viral infection of the nasal pharynx, runny nose, cough, all of that. It's usually caused by a virus. RSV is the one that kids end up in the hospital with. It's a very severe um, respiratory virus. Your rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, influenzas, there's A and B and parainfluenzas. These are all the viruses that we're going to see kids catching. We're going to treat fevers with antipyretics. We can use decongestants on kids six months or older, not on kids younger. And even with that, you want to be a little cautious because if you use them for more than a few days, you can get a rebound where 
the secretions get really thick and now it's harder for the child to get them up. And cough suppressants are even more um, used with more of a caution. We want the child to cough and get the things, the secretions that's that are in the lungs. We want them to cough those out. So we really don't want to use cough suppressants unless it's a dry cough. If it's moist at all, we want to encourage the cough, not suppress it. We want to give them rest and we want to make sure they get enough fluids to stay hydrated. So how do we know if it's viral or if it's bacterial, which could be our beta hemolytic streps, um, so viral versus strep throat. Well, viral, usually you have a, a gradual onset. Uh, bacterial, it's usually very sudden. They go from feeling okay to feeling horrible in a couple of hours. Viral, usually a low-grade fever, but on kids, it can be up to 101, 102. It's not a guarantee just because it's low-grade, but with strep, it's almost always very high. Um, fevers up to 104 are common. With a viral illness, it can start as a sore throat and a fever, but then you, within a day or two, you have those cold symptoms, the congestions. With bacteria, with strep throat, you don't get cold symptoms very often, um, unless they happen to have a virus at the same time, but the strep itself doesn't really make cold symptoms. With viral, you can get enlarged tonsils and a bit of redness on those tonsils. Um, over on the strep side, you're gonna see along with, they won't have the cold symptoms, but they'll have headache, a severe sore throat, and usually abdominal pain, often vomiting. And on their tonsils, you'll see white patches, exudate. Now on the virus, they may have swollen lymph nodes that are tender. On the strep, they absolutely will. They get enlarged lymph nodes, uh, the cervical lymph nodes. And with a virus, they can be moderately ill for one to five days. With the, the strep, they are acutely ill, and it can last as long as two weeks if we don't give them antibiotics and then we're setting them up for um, other problems from not treating it. So we want to treat strep with antibiotics quickly. So it's still on pharyngitis versus tonsillitis, so the pharynx being irritated versus the tonsils. Um, Virals about 80 to 90 percent of the time. Bac bacterial, we're usually talking about strep. If they have strep, once we put them on the appropriate antibiotic, they're no longer infectious after 24 hours on that antibiotic. We want to tell family to continue it till it's done, but we've weakened that bacteria enough that it can't spread person to person. It can live though, so we want to tell people get a new toothbrush or anything the child's been using in their mouth, um, toys that they chew on, anything like that, we need to disinfect them, things like toothbrushes after the 24 hours, so it's th they're no longer, the germs are not as um, hardy. Discard those things, clean all their toys. They can do tonsillectomies, and that's usually if a child has recurrent infections, and your book says three a year, um, I think some of our insurance companies in this area are a little more hesitant to do them. I think it's more than three a year. I think it's more like four or five a year. But anyway, it no matter how uh, we treat it, it comes back. If the tonsils are extremely enlarged, so we have hyp hypertrophy of the tonsils, so we're worried about any swelling, they won't be able to breathe if they've had recurrent abscesses. So. Uh, we don't actually kill the germs, we just get it under control in an abscess form. So those are reasons to take them out. They usually will take out the adenoids as well. Adenoids can be taken out separately uh, or together. Um, so after a tonsillectomy, usually it's a TNA, tonsils and adenoids, well, we're sending these kids home immediately. So we want to assess for postoperative bleeding. The easiest way for a parent to look for that is is the child continually swallowing. They're swallowing the blood. Um, that we also want to make sure we're giving them adequate pain control. That the family's going to be doing that, and not to give red or brown 